Welcome back to Econ 104 Introduction to Macroeconomics. Here we are in our second video on international trade and capital flows. In this video, we're going to be looking at relating our whole actual net exports, our trade of goods and services to the flow of international capital, the flow of money, that is our capital account. And what we're going to do to show this is really this odd accounting equality that I say odd, it's really not that odd, but it really throws a lot of people instant uh, at the start. And that is this equality that our current account, that is our exports, our trade balance must equal our flow of international payments, our flow of international investment of international finance. And we'll take a look at why that's the case. Hopefully we can do it in a simple way that kind of gets rid of the abstraction of the concept, often international trade, the politics, these different currencies that we're dealing with, brings in a lot of confusion, a lot of abstraction. Hopefully we can clarify, we can clear all that up and have a nice simple case to explore this. So. Let's go jump over, let's go take a look at that. And in that sense there, let's go and start off with a very simple case. And that simple case there is just gonna be kind of your household budget. And keeping in mind, that is that is trade, right? We said that, hey, trade is just any exchange of goods and services. And that fundamentally underneath that definition, there was no difference between international trade interprovincial trade, interpersonal trade. So let's go take a look at it on the personal level. And to start off, let's take a look at our current account. That is really our net exports, our trade balance. And what we're gonna take a look at is we're gonna be taking a look at the item. We're gonna be taking a look at our exports. That'll be money in positive. We'll take a look at our imports, that'll be money out negative, and then our final balance, such that our final balance will be exports minus imports. Exports minus imports, that's our net exports, or alternatively known in this way here as our trade surplus. So, okay, let's start off. First thing that we're gonna take a look at is your wage. Right, and in this case here, this is just essentially, maybe this is your monthly budget kind of idea. Monthly budget, your wage, this is you selling your services out to the world. You are selling your services and as a result, you are being paid your wage. So by selling your time, selling your labor, selling that service, you were able to earn what's gonna be your exports amount of we'll say 2000 for the month. Now at the same time, okay, that's what you were able to sell to the world, that's what you had a comparative advantage in was offering your labor. Now, you need to buy things from others that they were relatively better at producing. So we're gonna say housing, rent, we're gonna say groceries, so your food and the like, and we'll say utilities. So your phone, maybe your Netflix, your heat, your electricity, all of that included there in your utilities. Let's suppose for your rent, uh, let's say that was something like $1,000. Your groceries, let's say you were able to do that for 500. And let's suppose utilities, that sets you back 200. So, okay, all together at the end, what are we sitting at for our trade balance? We had 2,000 in, we had to spend 1,000, spend 500, that's 1,500, spend 200, that's 1,700. So 2,000 minus 1,700, we have a value of our net exports of $300. We have a trade surplus with the world of $300. That is, hey, we sold our wage, we've bought all the stuff we wanna buy in this month, and I have $300 left sitting, left just out there. Well, okay, in reality, right, okay, you have cash, you could just sit on this as cash and have it as cash and then there you go, it just sits there. But let's pretend this is a cashless society. That is, and in reality, a lot of Canadians carry very little in cash. So let's just make that assumption. This is a cashless society, meaning that what you have to do with this $300 
is you have to put it in the bank, right? You have to put it into a checking or a savings account or something along that line. So let's presume then that we have, and this is going to be our capital account. This is essentially our purchase and our sale of financial instruments. And again, what we'll have is we'll have our item. We'll have our positives, which is capital inflow. So capital inflow, that's a positive. And then we'll have our negative. This is going to be our capital outflow. And this is from our perspective, right? From me. Is money coming to me positive or is money going away from me negative? And of course, then we would have our balance. And in this case here, right again, our balance will be, we'll say inflow minus outflow. So, okay. Let's take a look at how all this goes. So what we have is we're going to go and we're going to say we're going to put a little bit of our money in savings. So as we do that, essentially the way you want to think about this is you have gone to the bank and you have just purchased a savings account. You have bought this financial instrument of a savings account. That is, from your perspective, you've just given the bank that money. For you, that is a capital outflow. That is money you no longer have. You just gave the bank we'll say $200, right? And you're like, but that savings account's in my name. Yeah, 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 that savings account is in your name. The way the savings account works, you can ask for that money back, but you've given that money to the bank. You have purchased this savings account for the time being. That is, you have purchased a financial instrument. At the same time, let's suppose that at some point during this month, Right? Sometimes you run into cash flow issues. We see that on the month on whole, you had $300 in the positive, but you know, pay comes in irregularly and expenses sometimes line up at different times. So let's say that you also, at some point during this month, you needed to take out a loan. That is, you used your credit card, a line of credit, something like that. You need to borrow some money. Again, this is essentially you sold a financial instrument and by selling this loan, by saying to the bank, hey, can you give me some money? And the bank saying yes, well, you have received, let's say you've received $100. So, okay, that would be a capital inflow. That's the bank investing, the bank saving in you, right? You saving in the bank, the bank giving you a loan is the bank saving money in you, essentially, if you wanted to think about it in that kind of context. And then finally, let's say that you also bought some mutual funds, right? It doesn't really matter. Maybe you added that money to your RSPs, your retirement savings plan, maybe a TFSA, tax-free savings account. It doesn't really matter. It's just there for illustrative purposes. And we'll say that, again, that was $200. So, okay, altogether, what did we have in our balance here? Your total capital outflows was 400. Your inflow was the 100, meaning that altogether we had $300 balance here. And that's not just coincidence, right? I didn't just make that happen. That would have to be the case that, hey, these guys in magnitude are equal to one another, right? And that that has to be. If we had this cashless situation where you couldn't just carry around that $300 in cash and never have it, I mean, even then, technically, we would say that that cash is now a financial instrument of the government. And really, that's not yours, right? In the same kind of way, when you buy a savings account, you're buying that savings account. But anyways, that aside, this whole bit is that with this extra money you had, you had to, with it, purchase financial instruments. You had to purchase savings accounts, purchase mutual funds. You had to borrow some money. All of this worked out such that your financial accounts, your capital accounts were equated to either your trade surplus or in the other case, our trade deficit. They always must equate. Okay, when we get into international trade, things change a little bit, but not really, right? When we get into international trade, 
Well, we would have our exports. All of the stuff we export, all of the money we get in. We would have our imports. All of the money that we spend in buying stuff from the world. As a result, we would end up with our trade balance. Okay. With that trade balance, well, what do we end up doing with it? Well, in this case here, we have $300. That is, we sold more stuff to the world than we bought from them. That is, hey, we're owed a bunch of money from the world. What do we end up purchasing? Well, we end up purchasing foreign stocks and bonds, right? We end up purchasing foreign stocks and bonds. That's essentially like these savings and mutual funds. We buy these foreign financial instruments and that there becomes our capital outflows equated with our final trade balance. At the same time, we're going to have some capital inflows just like we did here, right? But in the end, our capital account balance will always be equal to the trade surplus, our current account will always be equated in that way. Okay, let's, we have the idea there. Let's go on, take a look at our expenditure form of GDP and using our expenditure form of GDP, let's take a look at another example of how exactly this works. So GDP through the expenditure form, Okay, GDP through the expenditure form, we're trying to measure GDP, that's gross domestic product, the total output within a nation, the total expenditure within a nation, or the total income within a nation, right? They're all synonymous in that sense there. In economics, our typical variable that we use to denote income is Y, and as a result in macro, Y is the typical variable we use to denote GDP. So, okay. We're going to measure GDP, and we're going to measure it through our expenditure approach. So Y equals consumption plus gross investment plus government expenditure plus net exports. Okay, so we have this. What we're going to do, a little bit of algebraic voodoo as we play around with this, we're going to isolate net exports. So that is, we're going to subtract C, I, and G. So, okay, we're going to have Y minus C minus I minus G equals the value of our net exports. Okay, next little thing we're going to do, a little bit of a mathematical trick, right? Essentially, I'm going to just add zero to one side. And right, if I added zero, it does nothing, right? If you think about this, if we just wanted to kind of give it some numbers for a second, maybe this was 50, and then that was 10, 5, 10, and then that was 25. Well, hey, if I did this, and I did 50, 10, right, minus, minus 5, minus 10, and then I went plus 0, well, that still equals 25, right? I didn't do anything. I didn't change anything by adding zero. Ah, everything's still true, right? There's, there's nothing wrong in doing that. So let's go and add zero. And you're like, why? Why would we do that, Keith? Well, let's see. So what I'm going to do is I want to go Y minus C minus T. So, okay, what, why, why T? I'm just going to put brackets around this just so we can kind of exclude it to say, hey, let's pay attention to this. T, this is just going to be taxes, how much tax revenue is collected on whole. I then want to go plus T, hey, minus T plus T, those two are just going to cancel each other out. So nothing's happening. I just added by zero like I promised. Okay. What I'm then going to do is continue on minus I minus G equals net exports. A little bit of rearranging. Essentially, all I want to do is bring this plus T and this minus G together. So, hey, that's just rewriting it in a different order. So Y minus, and again, I can rewrite this guy a little bit too, T minus C, that doesn't change anything, plus T minus G minus I, right, this was a plus, got a little bit lazy there, equals net exports. 
And okay, why? Why are we going through all this? What exactly does all this mean? What's going on with this? Okay, let's talk about it. Why? GDP, output, income, expenditure. So yes, we did our expenditure approach, but let's think about this. Hey, they're all synonymous. Let's think about why GDP is income. So what do we have here? We have income minus our taxes minus our consumption. So hey, income minus taxes, that's a term we call disposable income. All my income that I have, subtract off the amount that the government collects in taxes, the leftover is my disposable income. Out of my disposable income, I have two options with it. I can either eat it today or I can eat it tomorrow. That is, I can either consume it or I can save it. So in this case here, if I take my disposable income and I subtract off what I eat today, the leftover, the leftover is what we would call our private savings how much money we save as all of our households within a nation within the region we're looking at so okay that first little bracketed term and again the brackets don't need to be there it's just so we can highlight it that first bit private savings second one then what's going on here well t tax revenue that is how much money the government brings in minus government expenditure so how much revenue the government earns minus how much money the government spends. Well, hey, that's just essentially our budget, right? Our government budget. Or in this case here, revenue minus expenses. We can think about it in this context too as our public savings. That is how much money the government is saving. And hey, keep in mind, you as a household can be a dis-saver. That is, you can be eating more today than you have as disposable income. You're borrowing from your future. You have negative savings. So, so can the government, right? The government can run a deficit. They can be spending more money than they're bringing in in tax revenue. So again, we could have negative public savings. These don't have to be a positive value. Together, Together, we would refer to private savings and public savings as our national savings. NS national savings. So, what do we have all together then? We have our national savings minus our investment equals our exports minus our imports. That is our trade balance. Hey, if we kind of think about this here, this guy, that guy's our capital account. How much we're saving, how much money we have domestically versus how many things, how many financial instruments we have to buy. And over here, we have our current account. That is our net exports. How much stuff we are buying versus selling from abroad. And right, just like we said, our current account and our capital account are going to be equated. So let's let's talk about a scenario. Let's talk about a scenario as to why this is really the case, why this is happening. Let's kind of like the scenario we just talked about. Let's suppose we are running a trade surplus, and that is our net exports are sitting at something like we could be extreme, let's say $300 billion of trade surplus. So Okay, $300 billion in trade surplus. What does that tell us about our situation in our capital account? Well, that tells us that our capital account must also be $300 billion. That is, we must have savings greater than investment, right? We must be saving more money domestically then we are investing in new capital, new infrastructure, new productive things for our economy, right? Capital, machinery, production plants, all of that. We're saving more money than domestically we have these new things to be done with. So, hey, where do I save this money? If there's no businesses locally who are like, hey, we want to build a new factory, give us some money and we'll give you a rate of return for investing in us. Where do you put your money? Well, you'd have to put your money abroad. In this case here, 
we have $300 billion that we are owed from abroad. So that $300 billion of excess savings is saved internationally. This is now all this excess savings ends up being invested in foreign countries, in foreign capital, right? Building the capital, building the productive capabilities of other countries, investing in their machinery, their equipment, their factories. So anytime we have this positive net exports, this trade surplus, well, that means our savings are greater than our domestic investment and we are saving, we're putting our money abroad. What about the other scenario? Let's suppose we have a trade deficit. Let's say that we have net exports of negative 200 billion, right? That is, we're buying more stuff from the world than we have money for. Well, hey, if we're buying more stuff from the world than we're selling to them, uh-oh, we owe them money, right? We owe them money. Ah, what's going to happen? Right? This is essentially how do we get them? How do we pay them for this? Well, we take out a loan, right? And in this case here, that savings is less than our investment. That is, hey, we're not saving very much domestically, but domestic industry is saying, hey, hey, we want to build new factories. We need new equipment. We need all this stuff. Somebody give us money so that we can build these new factories. We can buy this new capital, all of this. Where does all this money come from? Well, all this money comes from foreign investors, foreign finance in the tune of that $200 billion that we would need. So in that case there, having net exports of 200 billion means that we would be borrowing from abroad. We would have foreign investors, foreign savers, buying Canadian bonds worth $200 billion. So we see in this way here that the flow of international money and the flow of trade of goods and services are intricately linked, that the two have to be balanced, that we have to have this equality between our capital account and our current account. If you go back, this was several videos ago now, we took a look at our circular flow diagram. And again, this is posted up on our course site underneath the content tab if you want to go dig it up and take a look at it. Our circular flow diagram took a look at the flow of exports, imports, that is our goods market out to the world. And we saw in that as well the link between the flow of that and our financial instruments. Same kind of idea happening there. Same kind of idea. Exact same thing, we're just formalizing it here and equating these. So what we want to talk about next then, we have that this is an equality, that this has to be the case. What, what ends up happening if things start to change? What happens if government invokes policies and let's say all of a sudden the government starts running a massive deficit? What does that mean to us? Well, let's, let's take a look. Let's start off with our expression. So let's start off with private savings, y minus t minus c. And then we're going to add public savings. So that's t minus g. And then we're going to minus our investment, and that must equal our trade surplus, net exports. We can presume, right, just for simplicity, right, anytime we do anything like this in economics, we start to change one thing, we presume that that change is being done cetris paribus. That means we are holding everything else in the world constant. We're only allowing that one thing to change that we're analyzing. Boom, change. What's the impact? Everything else in the world constant, right? Simplifying assumption, I know but it makes the analysis a lot easier. So let's presume to start off that our net exports is zero, right? And that is just right now to start off, our exports equal our imports perfectly. What does that mean on the other side? Well, that means on the other side that our national savings equals our investment. That is, we don't have any capital inflows. We don't have any capital outflows. We are perfectly matching, we're perfectly meeting all domestic investment with domestic savings, right? And that would have to be the case if our net exports were also balanced. Okay, 
So this is our starting point. This is our starting condition. From here, let's suppose that the government runs a budget deficit. And that is they run a budget deficit by increasing their government expenditure. What exactly does that do? How does that end up changing things? And how does that end up impacting our net exports on whole? How does that end up impacting our flow of financial capital? Well, we can, we can look through this and we can work through it quite easily. So, okay, we've increased our government expenditure. Increased government expenditure, okay, so G has gone up. Hey, that's a bigger negative term. So all together, by government expenditure going up, my public savings has fallen. If my public savings has fallen, it must now be that national savings is less than investment. I'm not saving enough to meet my domestic investment. So, hey, if I'm not saving enough to meet the investment things, I'm going to have capital inflows. I'm going to have money from abroad coming in to essentially invest in these Canadian businesses to help them finance their new capital, their new equipment, their new machinery. In that sense as well then, hey, if I'm going to have capital inflows, well, my net exports are very similarly going to be dropping. And that is that capital inflow is coming in in order to finance, again, all of these excess imports. And I would have negative net exports. I would have a trade deficit as well. A trade deficit. That is my exports would become less than my imports as a result of this. So we can see how that kind of has worked through, how that has happened. More government expenditure, all else equal, would be less net exports, a dropping in that and an increasing trade deficit. What about another case? What about another case? Let's suppose that all of a sudden, all else equal, our consumers, they're feeling really wealthy, they're feeling very optimistic about the future, Things are looking good, and our consumers decide that, hey, they want to increase their consumption all else equal. So all else in the world equal, we're going to increase our consumption. Well, what's, what's that going to do? Well, okay, very similar to what we just took a look at. As I increase my consumption all else equal, that's going to be a drop in my private savings. Hey, if that's a drop in my private savings, well, less private savings means less national savings, giving me kind of this imbalance like we had here, meaning that there's not enough domestic savings to finance all of my domestic investment wants. So, okay, where does this financing come from? Well, it needs to come from loans from abroad. Outside of that, what we can also think about is, hey, if we want to consume more, we want to consume more, but where's that consumption going to come from? Some of it's going to be domestic for sure, but a lot of it's going to come from abroad as well. So, hey, we're going to start to import more stuff. So, hey, as we start to import more stuff, our imports rise. And again, we get this trade deficit. Same kind of story happening as when we increased our government expenditure. So, increasing consumption, all else equal would cause a trade deficit as well. All right, and again, big thing there, Cetris Paribus, all else equal. If we started off at that zero situation, spike in consumption will result in a change in capital account, change in current account. Okay, let's take a look at the last one here. Last one. Let's say all of a sudden, we have a spike in investment. So all of a sudden, firms want to increase their productive capability. They want to expand their factories. They want to buy more capital. And in order to do this, they need financing, right? They need some loans in order to get the money they need in order to 
buy that new factory, in order to buy their new equipment? Well, to start off, hey, before this spike in investment, all of their investment needs, all of their financing needs were met domestically. Now, all of a sudden, they need more investment. Where does this come from? Well, this spike in investment, again, that's going to cause national savings to be less than this new higher investment. So, hey, again, we need some capital inflow to make this happen. We're looking abroad to foreign savers. Foreign savers, they start to flood into the Canadian market. They start to buy these, can or not buy, but rather lend. They're buying Canadian financial assets. By buying Canadian financial assets, they're lending these Canadian companies money to invest in this new capital. And in that process there, we're also going to run into our trade deficit. And again, trade deficit. So in this sense here, we've worked through the impacts of, hey, a change in government expenditure, a change in consumption, a change in investment, the impact it would have on the capital account, right? The flow of international resources, the flow of international money, rather. And in this case here, in each of our cases, we witness capital inflows given a higher demand, either a drop in savings or an increase in investment. And that capital inflow is then met with net imports and thus trade deficits. Of course, this is all symmetric. This is all symmetric. If we had the opposite happening, if we had a drop in government expenditure all else equal, the government also started to run a surplus. If we had a drop in consumption, if we had a drop in private investment, they would have the opposite case. As these would drop, we would get a rise in net exports and we would begin to run trade surpluses. So, of course, the opposite would also be true. Perfectly symmetrical effects here. Okay. We've gone through that. We've taken a look at this. We've taken a look at, okay, flow of capital, the impacts it has on our trade balance and all that going on. But what exactly does this mean? Right. And often in the media, often in the media, when you're talking about trade balances, we end up seeing situations like, oh, the U.S. has an unfavorable trade balance. That is, we would say that they would have a trade deficit. That is, exports are less than imports. Alternatively, they would say something like, oh, Canada currently has a favorable trade balance. That is a trade surplus. Exports greater than imports. And okay, this language and even that whole ideology of a deficit or a surplus really makes it think, really makes you look at this and think, hey, trade deficit, unfavorable trade balance, well, clearly those are bad, right? Like we're using words like deficit, unfavorable, okay, there we go, that, that's bad. How can that be good? On the flip side, we're saying, hey, this is a favorable trade balance, a surplus, oh, a surplus is a good thing. So, hey, this this must be good. Well, Okay, that's that's not actually the case at all. That's not actually the case at all. Whether you have a trade surplus or a trade deficit, then them, them in themselves are not good or bad, right? It's not bad to run a trade deficit. It's also not bad to run a trade surplus. It may not be good to run a trade deficit, but it also might not be good to run a trade surplus. It is all contextual. It all depends on the situation. So are deficits actually unfavorable? Well, really, the answer to that is it depends, right? A true classic economist answer, it depends. And let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Okay. If trade deficits are bad, really what you're saying is that borrowing is bad, right? Because if you have a trade deficit, well, as we saw, your savings is less than your investment, so you need to borrow to make that happen. And the thing is, is that borrowing 
borrowing is not bad. Well, not necessarily a bad thing, right? There are times, there are contexts where borrowing is a very useful tool, where going into debt is actually the best thing you can do to take advantage of your situation, right? So example of that, let's take a look at a few classical kind of examples throughout the while, is hey, you have as your company a plan to expand your business and if you can get the financing for this, you can build a new factory, greatly increase your profitability over the next decade plus. So borrow today more profit forever. Hey, that's probably a good thing, right? If you can borrow today and get more profit forever, as long as this increase in profit offsets your cost of credit, this is a good business move. This is a good decision. You borrow that money today, you invest it in productive capital, increasing your output, increasing your profitability, and you're better off for it. So, hey, borrowing, borrowing can be good, right? We saw this historically, we saw this historically with South Korea. South Korea in the 70s, South Korea in the 70s ran trade deficits for quite a long time, right? They ran trade deficits for 10, 20 years as they were net importers, borrowing money, borrowing money from the world and investing this heavily in new productive capital, in new factories, in new production. More recently, well, more recently, it switched. South Korea now, on hold, is running trade surpluses, meaning on hold, North, South Korea, sorry, not North Korea, South Korea is now running these trade surpluses, meaning that, hey, now they have this excess of savings. They're essentially now able to repay that national debt, right? They're able to pay that off. They're able to pay back everything that they borrowed during this period in the 70s where they invested in their capital, where they built up their productive capabilities. We now see the big Korean firms like Hyundai, Kia, Samsung, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? U.S., early colonial days of, US, of the U.S., we saw very similar things. Okay. But of course, right, that doesn't mean that borrowing is also good. We also see cases where you borrow today strictly for more consumption today. And that is you're not increasing your productive capability, you're not increasing your output, you're not increasing your ability to repay it all. You're just borrowing money and consuming it and then you're going to have to foot that bill down the road. In this case here, well, maybe this isn't the best way to consume. Maybe this isn't the best reason to borrow. Sometimes cases can be made to borrow money to consume today for sure, right? But what we see in this case here is examples as in some African countries and some South America, or we can say including Mexico, some Latin American countries. American countries. In these cases here, they borrowed heavily. They borrowed, they borrowed, they borrowed, but they did not invest this borrowed money in new productive capital, in new machinery, in new equipment, in any of that stuff to increase their productive capabilities. So they didn't have any new rest uh, any new infrastructure, any new anything to increase their productivity. I shouldn't say new anything. They definitely had new stuff. Definitely did some good stuff with it, but on whole, we did not see an increase in productivity or in their output levels. As a result, well, when debts came due, there wasn't that boost in productivity. Ah, it became more difficult to repay, right? It became more difficult to repay. And in this case here, this period of trade deficits, this was unfavorable. This was problematic. So, okay. Both cases, they ran trade deficits, but in this case here with South Korea, and so I can make a few other examples here of countries that ran trade deficits, increased their productive capability. Yeah, those were good things. 
right? They were better off because of it. Other countries, uh, not so much, right? They didn't necessarily utilize that investment in the best of ways. Okay, well, we have other cases too. We have other cases, right? This is what happened with, if you've uh, looked at it, our Asian financial crisis of the 90s, the late mid 90s. This is one of our issues with running trade deficits is we have Thailand, Malaysia. They had large trade deficits. Now, okay, they borrowed heavily. This was through the 90s. They borrowed heavily at the idea of building up their infrastructure and all of this, but investors got spooked. That is, all of those people who were saving, all those foreign nationals who were buying Thai or Malaysian bonds, well, all of a sudden they got spooked. They weren't so sure about the future of these bonds anymore, if they were actually going to get their payment. And so they pulled out. They pulled out their financial capital. As a result, we had a fire sale of bonds. We had a collapse in the price of these financial instruments. So that's in the stocks and bonds in these countries, in Thailand, in Malaysia, and Indonesia as well there. And what happened is, is that began to happen. These prices dropped, this per increased instability for the banking sector, for the financial sector, it became more difficult on hold just to get credit. As all that happened, money dried up in the economy, and it was almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. We did begin to see economic hardships in these countries, and we ended up did seeing a massive recession due to the collapse in these financial instruments, due to all of a sudden this bit of spook and everybody pulling out. So that to say that, hey, by running these trade deficits, these countries also open themselves up to some might say a speculative attack, but really we would say more, you open yourselves up to these macroeconomic instabilities. Right. If all of a sudden you have this mass movement of people freaking out, being like, ah, you're going to fall more into this African Latin America case, not this South Korea case. Well, we're not sure if this is going to be a good credit risk. We're pulling our money now. Well, that can force it to happen. Even if you were on track to become the South Korea case, if all the investors got worried, if they all decided to pull their money now, they could create this macroeconomic instability and cause a recession, cause a collapse, this so-called self-fulfilling prophecy. So, okay. Trade balances, trade deficits, current account deficits, capital account deficits, this borrowing, it seems like, oh, wow, that's that's a bad thing. Well, like, like we said, right? Not necessarily. South Korea, USA, even in the early days of the US and forming the country, there's many more cases we could bring up where, hey, borrowing money, it makes sense at times. It's the way to build, to grow your capital. It's the way to really build and grow your economy as well. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we see there are risks with it, right? We see there are risks and we see those risks here. So what about the other side? Right, We see in, okay, trade deficits, they have potential, but there's a lot of risk associated with it. So, hey, clearly then, clearly trade surpluses, trade surpluses are good, right? They're always the best thing to do. Uh, not, not necessarily, right? We have the same kind of situation, right? We take a look and we take a look at Japan. Japan's ran a trade surplus for about 30 years now. At the same time, at the same time that they've ran this trade surplus for almost 30 years, they have hovered in and out of a recession for this last 30 years. They have had really high unemployment rates for 30 years. They've had stagnant productivity for 30 years. That is, well, maybe they could use a bit of trade deficit. Maybe they could use a little bit of capital inflow to build up their capital stock, to build up their productive capabilities, right? Necessarily being a lender to the world isn't always a good thing either. Germany, same kind of case. Germany has ran surpluses for years now. Again, Germany has seen stagnant growth throughout the last, throughout the last few decades. So, okay, 
trade surplus. You have all this excess capital as a result. But oh, all this excess capital, what are you going to be doing with it? Right? What are you going to be doing with it? Can you actually promote your industrial growth, your increase in output, your increase in productivity, or are you just going to stagnate as a result of it? Beyond this, beyond this, what we see is situations like uh, like pre pre independence India. India ran trade surpluses with Britain, and that is right. So okay, ran a trade surplus exports greater than imports. They sold more stuff to Britain than they bought from Britain. That means very similarly, the amount of savings they had in India exceeded domestic investment, right? And okay, so you're selling more stuff to Britain. So Britain's essentially saying, hey, India, we owe you, right? You've sold us all this stuff. We owe you a bunch of money because you sold us more stuff than we bought from you. Here's a bunch of financial instruments for you to hold on to. That is essentially in this case here, a trade surplus, trade surplus, savings greater than domestic investment. So we had a capital outflow. That is this capital outflow. We are investing primarily, or rather Indians pre-independence were investing more money, not necessarily more money, but they were having their capital flow out to Britain, investing in British capital, in British industry, in British machinery, factories, et cetera, et cetera, rather than Indian factories, Indian machinery, Indian infrastructure. This was a big concern, right? This was a big thing of, hey, why are we flowing all of our money out there? Isn't this just a big financial drain to be sending all of our money to Britain? We're sending all of our stuff there, send all of our money to, right? This became a big source of contention. This was one of the main factors, well, one of the main, this was a big factor though, that definitely led to the push for Indian independence was this concern over capital outflow. That, hey, money was being invested abroad when Indian culture, Indian society, Indian infrastructure was also struggling and needing money to advance. So some thing there, right? Surplus is not necessarily the best either. Let's bring this into a bit more of a interpersonal level, right? We saw at the start that, hey, trade is trade and this capital account, current account, we can look at it from nations. We could also look at it on an individual level. Let's kind of take a look at why, hey, having a positive, negative, or even a zero current account balance is not necessarily good, bad, or neutral, right? It's just, it's very contextual. It depends a lot on the situation. And that is, hey, let's take a look at a, a lot of you, right? A lot of students, typically younger, typically starting off your life, typically in that building phase. Most, most students, most in this phase here, most will run trade deficits. That is, in order to finance your education, in order to finance your consumption, in order to finance all of this, you need to borrow, whether that be student loans, whether that be other loans, whatever that might be, maybe it's from parents and family, you're borrowing in order to finance this. This borrowing, okay, some of it's going towards current consumption. The hope is that you are borrowing, oh, that's not how you spell borrowing. You are borrowing to invest in your human capital. Ah, man, I can't spell. In your human capital, right? That is your skill set, your education to increase your productivity so that in the future, when those loans come due, you have increased your output that is your income, and attached to that, right, you are now more productive as well. So you've increased your productivity, which has increased your output. That, hey, you've run a trade deficit, you are borrowing money, but it makes sense. 
You don't have a lot right now. You need this money to get that investment in capital so that in the future, you can get higher income. You can have more output. You can be more productive. So, hey, that makes sense. That makes sense at this time in your life, in that stage of your development, to be in a deficit. Okay. What about another case? Let's take a look, right? Let's suppose most will say, and just generically, stereotypically speaking, let's say middle aged professional. Okay. In this middle aged profession, well, at this point in life, you're now at your peak output, more or less, you're at your peak productivity. Well, in this case here, hopefully, right, the ideal is that you are running a trade surplus that you do not have a deficit, right? That you are not necessarily at this point. There's exceptions, of course. Maybe you have a new business idea. Maybe you're like, man, I got laid off. I need new training. I can increase my output if I retrain and I have temporary deficit for that, right? There's, of course, the exceptions. But typically, generically, stereotypically speaking, most in this group are going to be running trade surpluses. They already have this high output. As they have this high output, they tend to stagnate in their growth in income year over year. They tend to stagnate in their productivity year over year because, hey, they're not reinvesting in themselves. But instead, what they're doing is this trade surplus means that they have excess savings. And this excess savings, what are they being used for? Well, they're being squirreled away for the future. They're being squirreled away right in this kind of situation for those retirement years. So we see typically, right, given certain stages of development, if we want to think about it in this kind of like developmental economics kind of mindset, it makes sense for certain countries, for certain people to run deficits at certain times. It makes sense for certain people, for certain groups to run surpluses at certain times. Does it mean deficits are bad? No. Does it mean surpluses are bad? No. Does it mean other one is good? Again, no, not necessarily. They are simply neutral. They are not good or evil. They are amoral. It is a tool and it is how you use them. So that's the big takeaway in this result of, hey, surpluses versus deficits. Okay, the last thing to briefly talk about in this video set, last thing to briefly talk about is the distinction between trade balance and our trade level. So to start off, trade balance. This is what we've been looking at. This trade balance is our exports minus our imports, right? That's our net exports. If exports greater than imports, we run a trade surplus. If exports are less than imports, we run a trade deficit. On the other hand, we have trade balances. Sorry, not trade balance. Oh my goodness, I just said that. We're running, we take a look at trade level. What the trade level is, is the proportion of our exports to our GDP on whole. So that is what percentage of exports do we have to GDP? The bigger the level of trade, the more the country is playing to the comparative advantage, right? The more trade they're getting involved in, that is the more gains from trade they're having. And as a result of this, yeah, there's more gains from trade to be had. However, as you open up to have a higher level of trade, you're also opening yourself up to be influenced by a lot more macroeconomic instability, right? And that's especially the case if you're running long-term trade deficits. So... Increased trade level, increased gains from trade as you engage in more and more trade. But if you're in a trade deficit situation, well, there's that risk of increased instability as well. But what really determines these? Ultimately, geographical location, a lot of history, a lot of where you are. For example, the USA, they have, uh, they actually run quite large trade deficits, but they have a very small trade level. Right? Being a rather isolated country, they have us, Canada, right next door. They have Mexico. But this trade level is only about 13% of their GDP. 
right? So relatively speaking, that's a pretty small level of trade they have. So even though they've run continual large trade deficits, it's not as big of a concern for them because their exports only account for a small proportion of their total output. Compare this with many Asian countries, many European countries that are surrounded by lots of countries. In these cases, they're running trade levels of 50% or more. That is over half of their output is exported. Well, in this case, in this case, huge amounts of your GDP is determined by your exports. If you were to run large deficits or continued de deficits for a long period of time, that opens you up to a lot of potential macroeconomic instability, right? That's a lot of volatility that you could end up seeing. If you end up running surpluses, well, great. But then again, that's money that you're shipping abroad instead of investing in your own economy. So we see in a lot of European, Asian countries, we see high levels of trade and then the corresponding, typically lower surpluses or deficits, closer to zero. But of course, if they differentiate, if they change, that's where you end up getting your stability problems, your instability possibly arising. Okay, in this video, what have we covered? Big things, we've explored the capital and current account. Big takeaway is that that capital and current account must be equated. If we are net exporting, right, if we have more stuff going out to the world, then we must also have capital outflows that we must also be investing more abroad than we are receiving from foreigners. If we're a net importer, that is, we're buying more stuff from abroad, well, then we must also then have capital inflows, that is, we're borrowing, and we must have foreigners investing, bringing their money into our country. That's the big takeaway there, this relationship between the flow of goods and services and the flow of money, the flow of financial instruments. We then wrap that up to have a discussion about, hey, trade surpluses versus trade deficits. Are they good? Are they bad? Hopefully by the end of that, you kind of got the idea that they're amoral. They have their place. Surpluses are good for a time. Deficits are good for a time. But it's really contextually, uh, it really depends on the context, depends on what's happening on your stage of development. We wrapped up taking a look at this distinction between trade balance and trade level. This is kind of just a FYI situation. As we carry on in this course, our big thing we're going to be taking a look at is, of course, our trade balance, this idea of our net exports. Okay, if you have any questions on anything we covered in this video, please feel free to reach out to me, post in the comments below, post on the D2L Frequently Asked Questions, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.